Good afternoon and welcome to this IISS webinar, New Missile Technologies, Old Arms Control Solutions. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and also thank you to our panel for participating and sharing their thoughts on this important subject. My name is Timothy Wright. Um, I work on the Missile Dialogue Initiative at the IISS. Uh, the MDI project is an international network of analysts and policymakers supported by the German Federal Foreign Office, which examines policy responses and stability implications of the proliferation of advanced missile systems and related technologies. You can learn more about the MDI project on the IISS's webpage and also subscribe to its monthly newsletter. Uh, before we begin the webinar, um, I'd just like to lay down, a few, uh, couple of, lay down a few ground rules. So first, the event is on the record. And second, we will be using the raise hand and the Q&A function on the Zoom app. So please feel free at any time to raise your hand or to submit a type question. And we will respond to that during the Q&A portion of the webinar, which should take place at around half past 12. So, and so with that, I would like to hand over to my IISS colleague, Douglas Barry, a Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace. Douglas? Uh, thanks, Tim, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to you all, uh, whichever time zone you're in. As Tim said, uh, my name is Douglas Barry. I'm Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace at the IISS. I'll be the Chair for today's session, and I have the good fortune to host a highly qualified panel to model the subject of today's discussions on the theme of emerging missile technologies and strategic stability. William Albert is Director of the Arms Control Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Centre at NATO. Uh, Rear Admiral John Gower served until December 2014 as Assistant Chief of Defence Staff, Nuclear, Chemical and Biological in the UK Ministry of Defence. Dr. Pavel Podvig is senior researcher in the WMD program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. And Dr. Heather Williams is a lecturer in the Defence Studies Department at King's College. Uh, by way of opening comment, I'd simply note that while the current pandemic is the understandable focus of attention and concern, the challenges in defence and security remain and in the nuclear arena are becoming more difficult. The three main actors, China, Russia and the US all appear to be monologuing while nuclear arms control structures of the Cold War era have all but eroded. In nine months, New START will end unless an extension is agreed between the US and Russia. However, Washington seems to want to move to trilateral rather than bilateral relations with China at the center of this. And meanwhile, the Chinese, Russian and US armed services are in an acquisition cycle for classes of weaponry, and I'm thinking, for example, of Mach 5 plus glide vehicles and cruise missiles, that are out in front, arguably, of any arms control agreements to manage effectively such systems, or indeed the proliferation. And perhaps here we can discuss the role of the missile technology control regime at some point in today's event. And if this were not a dismal enough horizon, Sino-American relations are being darkened further by US allegations as to the source of COVID-19. So I'm looking to the panel to see if there's a path we can begin to chart that will support rather than undermine mutual security. Uh, William, I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and thanks for inviting me. It's, a, it's an amazing panel and a beautiful day here in Brussels to talk about uh, such a great topic. Uh, so I want to talk about NATO's interest, uh, my definition of arms control, uh, what the missile threats we're addressing are, the current status and the way ahead. So NATO's got a very long-standing interest in arms control historically going back decades throughout the Cold War, but a current very strong interest in using arms control to address current threats to the alliance as well as future threats as well. Um, for allies, arms control in the traditional definition is something that has to apply to all parties, it has to contribute to security and stability, it should provide transparency, and it should have some degree of verifiability. And these principles can be used to address uh, missile threats, but I think it's gonna have to go beyond that. Because arms control in the traditional definition, coming out of Schelling and Halpern, the Cold War definition, the one that we're used to, is when parties with a security dilemma seek to mitigate the risk of unintentional conflict and the cost of ruinous arms races. They have that shared interest and so they negotiate an agreement 
that then helps relieve the pressure so they can seek political solutions. Now, in the broader context, a lot of people use arms control to mean anything that limits weapons, uh, the spread of weapons, the use of force, everything from international humanitarian law, arms, to export controls, to embargoes. I think in order to address missile threats, you're going to have to use a much broader tool set. And why is that? Because we're talking about missile threats. Uh, they're not all new technology. A lot of this is older technology. Uh, we're talking about the spread of ballistic missiles around the world, particularly solid fuel, precision guided, WMD capable, longer range uh, missile systems that are including to non-state actors for the first time that are becoming more and more ubiquitous. And we have some threats you've seen in bilateral arms control, things like the INF Treaty and START and New START addressing ground launched ballistic systems, sea launch systems, air launch systems. Uh, and you also see global regimes like the Missile Technology Control Regime, Hate Code of Conduct, et cetera. But unfortunately, we're also seeing a lot more non-ballistic missiles. And this is the real threat. Older technologies, but global spread of cruise missiles, of drone technology, hypersonic boost glide, even crazy old Cold War ideas like undersea long-range torpedoes, air launch ballistic missiles, uh, nuclear-powered cruise missiles. So, but it's all about ballistic and non-ballistic longer range delivery of dual capable systems. And unfortunately with non-ballistic systems that has huge impact on price of stability. They're excellent for first strike. Uh, they're not easy to detect. They're very hard to defend against. And so they're incentivized for first use. And also we have this new uh, wrinkle on the whole thing where commercial firms and non-state actors have access. In the Cold War, you would say it was the US and then the Soviets who had access to solid fuel, longer range space systems, all these kinds of things. Now that's within the reach of commercial firms. So the spread is much, much wider. And as um, Douglas pointed out, um, we're talking about Russia and China uh, who are looking at racing and all of these different systems, um, diversifying their delivery systems for WMD and a huge cascade and the security dilemmas that are driving these systems are cascading throughout the world. So not just US, Russia, not just Russia, China, China, India, India, Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, non-state actors, the Houthis and Hezbollah also developing uh, or acquiring these technologies. So what do we do? For NATO, the homework is clear. On the one hand, we have to ensure that our deterrence is still credible because ultimately a lot of these systems, like I said, the non-ballistic systems are first strike systems so we have to ask ourselves, does the deterrent still work against non-state actors and states that could threaten us? And then can we look at what kinds of different tools in the much broader arms control toolkit can help us? And that'll depend. I think it'll be a combination. I think it'll be rules and norms, export controls, transparency, restraint. But we can't look at this as a regional problem. If there's anything that we've learned post-Cold War, it's that it's not regional. It's not just Russia. Uh, even in Europe, Russia would say, well, what about Ukraine? What about Sweden and Finland? We would say, what about Belarus? What about Armenia, Azerbaijan? Uh, Russia would say, what about China? Again, China would say, what about India? India says, what about Pakistan? Pakistan, what about Israel? Israel, what about Iran? North Korea, South Korea, Japan, these are global threats. We have to have global solutions. We can't just have regional solutions to the arms control threat, to the missile threat, I mean, uh, globally. So obviously bilateral US-Russia talks are gonna be important and allies will continue to support the United States in their talks with Russia and try to put Russia under pressure and under notice that they have to join in seriously on arms control. Allies will also support trilateral arms control. We're gonna to try to convince China. Each ally has a role in telling China that they as a global power have to take global responsibility on missile threats. Um, but we have to look at all the different export control tools, everything from the Australia Group, Nuclear Supplier Group, Missile Technology Control Regime, Hague Code of Conduct, Bosnar, UNTIA. How can these systems be improved and strengthened? And then what are the gaps? Do we need new agreements? Should there be global transparency on non-ballistic long-range systems? Should there be restraint? Uh, I've heard Rose Gottemuller, for instance, talk about, you know, uh, even in trilateral arms control, mixing and matching systems so that you have uh, longer range systems, shorter range systems, cruise and ballistic all in the same basket. Uh, but ultimately it's about the hard work. Why are countries seeking all of these systems? It's because of security dilemmas. And so the unfashionable difficult answer is arms control is not magic. We're gonna have to seek 
new solutions. We're going to have to resolve underlying conflicts that force countries to seek these systems to defend themselves. We're going to need some kind of transparency. I think we're probably going to need on non-ballistic systems, on the hypersonic boost glide and cruise missiles, some sort of discriminatory regime that says that those countries have them have to be limited and it can't spread to other countries. Um, and then eventually we're going to have to look at rollback. The UN Security Council resolutions have tried to roll it back with Iran and North Korea and Syria, and it hasn't been as successful. We're going to need new global impetus. Unfortunately, it all comes down to shared interest. It all comes down to political will. We'll see where we get. But on the NATO side, we're going to work as hard as we can to come up with what we think the right solutions are for the global system, and then to build consensus and to push for those agreements in existing agreements, create new agreements where possible, uh, put pressure on Russia, try to encourage China to join and see where we can get. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, William. Uh, I think now, John, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, firstly, I wanted to build on one of William's quick fire points, because uh, if missile technology control is not married with arms control and reduction by the missile halves, it risks the opposite effect. The have-nots will drive harder for missile capability, especially as the entry level in missiles, non-nuclear and ballistic, are seen as less internationally damning than nuclear weapons to acquire. So arms control and reduction by those who have them remains an essential component of non-proliferation. And I don't think there's any way and, and, and sense, I'm sure that's not what William meant, but I think there's no sense that you can, you can separate these two elements. Uh, the, the primary purpose, of course, of missile arms control, in my mind, is to reduce the threat of a nuclear exchange, either directly or by uh, miscalculation. Secondary benefits in the conventional arena, in my view, should never allow diversion from the primary objective. So how do I see missile arms control right now, particularly in respect to missile technology? Well, frankly, and it's a bleak view, it's, it's the drying out meat in a breadless sandwich. The missing bottom slice is a genuine focus and desire by the nuclear armed states to engage and develop trust and reignite arms control in any sense. The filling is the actual arms control. And as William says, as, sorry, as uh, Douglas says, the last one of those is flickering out. It's drying out because of the lack of the bread layers. And from where I sit, it's well past its sell by date and looking very dangerous to eat. The missing top slice would match nuclear arms state shift to a genuine desire to engage with a long-term view of arms control, which while useful in its own context, I think is best seen and managed as part of a holistic Germany of reduction. Any analysis shows missiles are the place to start to best serve the end of the ultimate reduction implicit in Article 6. And to finish the analogy, this unappetizing lunch is also all we have in a lunch hour, which is rapidly coming to an end. If nuclear armed states are not focusing on arms control and reduction, then they're focusing on the security issues which drive retention and even expansion. They're nervous about national security in the context of real and frankly extrapolated or even imagined threats. They are nervous and there are a variety of encroaching factors that magnify that nervousness. Entanglement, deliberate or otherwise, of nuclear and high-end conventional capability and posture. A return to arsenals with more flexible, usable and dual capable systems, which is shifting the nuclear hazard from strategic systems to those which heighten risk of miscalculation, misinterpretation and a lowering of use threshold. The top of the list are dual capable cruise missiles and short or medium range ballistic missiles. And the additional national nervousness brought on by the economic, territorial and social upheavals from the very real and increasing effect, effects of climate change, the increasing encroachment of artificial intelligence and machine learning in national intelligence management and analysis and in military decision making. And most recently, a growing understanding of how getting preparations largely wrong, despite warning, can have unprecedented effects in the global COVID-19 pandemic. All of these add nervousness to a state and a nervous nuclear armed state is in no one's interest. Nervous for economy, security or cohesion of the state and its peoples. And all of those have been conflict triggers in the recent past. So I'm gonna to refer to a paper I presented to the UN First Committee last October. The fact that the nuclear armed states, all nine, not just the recognized five, need to work on matters particularly relating to missiles 
to rebuild trust and regain momentum, to build the bottom layer of the bread so that the meat can sit on it and then be sandwiched in by a long-term look. They need to work on restraint, on relevance and reassurance, on the readiness, reciprocity and reduction. And I suggested then and would bank now a 10-point code of responsible nuclear armed states. And in particular, I'll focus on those that have direct relevance to missile arms control. That we should move and retain weapons to lowest readiness, that we should look for reciprocity in posture, policy and doctrine, which bolster strategic stability. We should isolate strategic systems from encroachment entanglement with emerging technology. And most importantly, and this is my key point, we need to set the top layer of the sandwich. We need to sketch out a likely reduction path for a, an arms control regime to have continued relevance. For a lack of an agreed, if only in principle, pathway to disarmament allows the perils we all identified to magnify. And I think it's unhelpful to examine each of these components independently of other. We need a framework within which future arms control work can be undertaken. Such a framework would involve progressive activity towards reducing omnilaterally and then through the lens of a single relatively survivable strategic system. And there's currently little or no agreement as to where on such a path we might be, even what might it look like. And I think there are two milestones that I wish to focus on in the discussion today. The first milestone would achieve when the most susceptible to nuclear warfighting weapons were controlled and eliminated. And as I have stated, these are predominantly nuclear cruise missiles and short range and medium range ballistic missiles. And proliferation of these weapons in the conventional domain, the sort of areas that most of the um, points that William was just making aim at, this confuses and conflates the miscalculation and misinterpretation risk. These systems in the hands of state or non-state actors, in the hands of non-nuclear armed states, directly conflate the risks of nuclear states misinterpreting or miscalculating in crisis. And I think achievement of such a milestone would be akin to the stabilizing effects of the post-Cold War presidential nuclear initiatives and the Russian responses. It would have that effect. The second milestone would be the removal of any remaining weapons, primarily those tactical and delegated in conflict, which did not meet the criteria of strategic survivable politically controlled weapons of deterrence. And so in the missile brain realm particularly, I contend that future arms control discussions and agreements, particularly on the control reduction and even elimination of many missiles with both conventional and nuclear capability, would benefit from understanding their placement within such a schematic pathway. And it's no longer enough to look at arms control as an end in itself. We have to reignite arms control and I think the greatest chance of doing that is by hanging the hooks of arms control on a pathway of some schematic agreed pathway that makes sense. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, John. Um, Pavel, I hope John hasn't eaten all your sandwiches. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity uh, to speak. I'll it's impossible to cover everything, so I'll cover, I'll focus on a number of issues, uh, kind of closer to the uh, to the uh, Russia and U.S. US Russian arms control. Uh, if we look at the history of uh, new systems and arms control, uh, the, the problem is not really new. Uh, those of you who remember, uh, I don't, uh, the debates in the in the 70s, the uh, Air, air launch cruise missile uh, actually was a very serious problem in, in, in the salt negotiations. Uh, but in the end, it, it was sort of solved. Uh, they were included, they were, you could argue that it was not entirely satisfactory solution, but in the end, kind of it persisted and they were somehow counted in the start and a new start. And today uh, there is this, uh, uh, they are still under the arms control umbrella. So it, it is it is it is possible to uh, to uh, to bring uh, these new systems uh, in in the arms control framework. Uh, another point that is uh, interesting to note in 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 that 
context is uh, that uh, the the airline cruise missile or cruise missile appeared as a as a response to uh, air defense largely, uh, and uh, the same thing is or a similar thing happens uh, today with this kind of a new exotic system. And again, I'm talking mostly about uh, Russia here. Uh, which are largely a response to uh, ballistic missile defense. And uh, uh, these are, of course, the hypersonic glider, and uh, which, which, is, which started 30 plus years ago as an anti-missile defense uh, program. And definitely the new exotic stuff, uh, the nuclear-powered cruise missile or this underwater drone, these are all uh, uh, largely political projects uh, that uh, were sold or they were supported precisely because they sort of offered a way to counter missile defense. So uh, I'm certain that had missile defense not appeared uh, on the agenda, uh, I'm sure that these programs would not have received uh, the kind of support that they did. Uh, so in the end, I. I'm in the kind of a skeptical camp uh, as to whether these systems are really useful in terms of anti-missile defense, uh, because if you want to defeat defense, the ballistic missiles are still your best bet. Uh, but we all know that uh, these systems nevertheless could uh, could uh, have some uh, destabilizing potential in many ways, not just the first strike, second strike. Uh, but uh, they uh, they could alter the calculation and uh, uh, give uh, and start uh, all kind of developments that would uh, drive the uh, arms race and all uh, kind of uh, developments of this kind. So what do we do? I think uh, at this point uh, we. Uh, there is not much hope that we, we can restart the U.S.-Russian arms control, not to mention trilateral arms control with China in the way it uh, it uh, happened so far. Uh, so I think uh, we should try uh, to maybe make sure that uh, none of these uh, systems are kind of uh, fall through the cracks. And uh, there is again the story with the air-launched cruise missiles uh, sort of gives some hope. Uh, because at that point uh, there was a there was an understanding there was a an agreement that yes these systems they should be counted in the arms control process not not necessarily uh, in a perfect way but uh, but there was an understanding that they they belong there and here I think there we, we have a kind of good news and a uh, not so good news uh, the the good news I guess is that uh, at least in principle, Russia is on record saying that it is ready to discuss uh, all these exotic systems uh, in the context of strategic arms control. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a positive sign. Uh, the, of course, uh, that assumes pretty heavily that there will be strategic arms control dialogue, and uh, I definitely we, we don't know what will happen with that willingness uh, to discuss if uh, new start is not uh, is not extended uh, but nevertheless that's a, that's a good sign uh, not so good sign is uh, that uh, this kind of openness or readiness is not quite supported on the uh, on the US side and in fact there is a the again the United States is on record saying that the hypersonic gliders should not be covered by uh, arms control agreements uh, because they are not ballistic. We know the, the legalese uh, there. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that it's, it could be reasonable kind of legal position to take, uh, and it may appear to have some advantages, but in the end, it will come back and bite the United States. And we've seen that uh, all, all the time in uh, in the arms control. So, uh, what 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 can be done here? I think there is a uh, we should try to reach a general agreement that certain things should be included in the arms control framework, and that 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 does not have to be a kind of a firm treaty or a firm document. Uh, but uh, we need to uh, steer the discussion uh, in uh, that that direction. 
uh, because and in the end, uh, the same uh, as with the uh, with the alchems, uh, the what will happen that they will be integrated uh, in in the uh, in the arms control, but according to their kind of real capability and real usefulness. Uh, my take is that uh, these are uh, these are uh, largely niche systems. They don't offer any kind of a, a game change, and in the end, they will find that uh, place accordingly in the arms control uh, efforts. Uh, so, but uh, to to do that uh, again, we we need to uh, we need to accept that yes, uh, the the there, there are. Uh, these systems uh, belong there. They belong to arms control and sort of try to close uh, various loopholes uh, that uh, that may uh, people may try to may want to exploit. In the end, uh, it will uh, again. Uh, it, it is a better uh, way to dealing with these issues than just uh, trying to ignore them. Okay, let me stop here and. Bubble. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and last but not least, Heather. Hi, well, um, thank you. I just also want to thank the organizers for putting this on. Also thank the participants. I had a really quick look at the participants list. And it's nice to see people from all over the world in Australia, California. So it's a kind of might be a nice benefit to this format. Um, so I'm going last because I come last in the alphabet, but it's actually a really natural follow, follow on from all of the other discussions. Um, so what I'll be discussing are some new possible new arms control solutions. And I'm gonna do a little thought experiment and offer up three specific scenarios for arms control of hypersonic glide vehicles. Um, and so I'm kind of taking up John's call for a new arms control framework, which I think of as asymmetric arms control. Um, but the main point that I want to get across is really simple, and it's kind of foot stomping something William had said, which is the nature of strategic stability is changing. Um, it's including more domains. It's not just about nuclear weapons anymore. It's about new technologies. And so as strategic stability changes, arms control also needs to change and cross domains. Um, I'm defining, I'm also using a Schelling Halpern definition of strategic stability as uh, crisis stability and arms race stability, but really it's about reducing the incentives to use nuclear weapons first um, or to further isolate um, or, or to further escalate crises. Um, during the Cold War, this w definition, it was, it was really specifically nuclear, at least from the United States perspective, um, and it was defined as survivable second strike, a survivable second strike force. This is definitely changing um, in terms of what is a strategically stable system. So how can arms control cross domains and become more asymmetric, as I've suggested? So scenario one um, is confidence building measures. Uh, this would, could potentially be between the US, Russia, and China, and it would be CBM specifically on hypersonic glide vehicles. So what I'm thinking here is something like mill-mill dialogues um, on, how these, on how hypersonics are being incorporated into the bigger strategic force posture. What percentage will be nuclear? What percentage will be conventional? Um, how are states relying on these? You know, most nuclear possessors do big strategic posture reviews or integrated reviews about what is the role of nuclear weapons in their strategic posture. Well, what would be the role of hypersonic glide vehicles in strategic postures? And can you have some sort of um, non-legally binding, but dialogue on that. Um, this has some obvious problems and challenges. The number one problem, I think, is that uh, Russia has made it very clear that any future arms control, they want to be legally binding treaties. And so there might be a reluctance to engage in this sort of informal dialogue. Um, so that's kind of one of the first challenges. The other challenge is that if you look at the history of arms control, it usually, with one or two exceptions, it usually doesn't include technologies that are still under development. And hypersonic technology is still under development, particularly in terms of the range or possible range of hypersonic glide vehicles. So usually technologies don't get sucked up into an arms control agreement until they've, they've almost peaked. As I said, there are a few exceptions. But that would be another challenge to scenario one of confidence building measures that countries might just not want to talk about this for now. Um, scenario two uh, is, would be uh, ratios. And so this would be something like a US-Russia new start follow-on that would set a common ceiling for delivery vehicles of all kinds, as William had said, 
had I mentioned. However, within that ceiling, there would be a ratio of Tra quote unquote traditional delivery of vehicles to hypersonics or so you might have a ratio of how many of your delivery vehicles are um, SLBMs, how many are Alcoms and cruise missiles, and how many are hypersonics. Um, historical example of this is the Washington Naval Treaty that set ratios of different naval capabilities in the interwar period. Um, and this would also have um, put some limits on hypersonic um, glide vehicles. Um, challenge with this, uh, the biggest challenge is that it wouldn't include China. And this administration at least has made it clear that future arms control has to be trilateral. Um, any new start follow on, I think the biggest challenge is going to come from Washington and it's going to be getting any treaty ratified by Congress. Um, but then the additional challenge, which is going to be pervasive for any of these um, kind of mechanisms that we're talking about is how do you verify a, a dual capable system? How can you tell? Because right now the way that we count arms control is we don't go out and count nuclear warheads, right? We count delivery vehicles as proxies. If those are dual capable, it's really hard to use them as a proxy if you don't know if they're conventional or nuclear. So that would, ha that would be an additional challenge to be worked out. And so that brings me to scenario three, and this is the more ambitious one. Scenario three would be arms, a uh, kind of comprehensive arms control agreement, but with, uh, um, with various stages. So stage one would be a US-Russia agreement, such as what I had mentioned previously, where you have a common ceiling for all of your delivery vehicles to include hypersonic glide vehicles. Once that ceiling comes down to a certain point, then China perhaps could, could join um, and they could um, go down to an even lower ceiling. So this is a bit more complex. It's not, there's not a big precedent for it in the history of arms control. As I said, this is a thought experiment. Um, but there would be verification similar um, to New START. And if you wanted to be really ambitious, you could even include warhead limits on this the way that you do with New START. Um, the challenges for this, uh, I just don't think China is particularly likely to join arms control at this time. Um, you also have the problem of the technology development and the problem of Congress still remains. However, if you want a, like some grand um, scheme for how to incorporate hypersonics into arms control, um, this is a, a more ambitious comprehensive option. Um, so just to wrap up, I, I wanted to keep this short just to um, allow a lot of time for discussion. Um, like the other speakers, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the future of arms control over the next few years. However, it, the future of arms control and for arms control to include these new technologies depends on so many variables and so much uncertainty. Will New START be extended? What is the future of the Open Skies Treaty? A, a lot of it depends on the outcome of the US election. It depends on the development of these technologies themselves. But one thing that hasn't really come up yet Sorry, my doorbell just rang. Um, <laughs> one of the things that hasn't come up yet um, is gonna be economic pressure, particularly following the pandemic. And um, in the past, economic pressures have kind of inspired countries to explore arms control options as a means of cost saving. And so I think that that could be an opener, that could be an opening for uh, US, Russia, China arms control. I'm gonna stop there and go tell that person to go away. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Al. Um, an extraordinarily rich uh, set of, uh, of views uh, and comments there that I won't even begin to try uh, uh, and pick my way through. Uh, uh, was it important? Was it a DHL package? It, it actually is a DHL package, Doug. <laughs> Funny that you should know that. <laughs> um, Fascinating. Uh, I mean, really, really interesting. I, I, I'll abuse the chair's position and ask the first question, and I might even try and slip in too. Uh, one of which is just a general question to the panel, which is, how can you incentivize China here? Because at the moment, it seems to me, uh, China has a great deal to lose and very little has been put on the table in terms of what it gains. So how does Washington in particular, if it's minded, actually say to the Chinese, we really do need you to engage because this is about mutual security. The language coming out of the US at the moment stresses security in terms of a national position. Uh, it's not security for, for, for all participants. And the second element of that really is, how do you move and can you move quickly enough 
from bilateral to trilateral in the next nine months. Otherwise, you know, new start goes, there is no extension. And where does that leave us? I'd be intrigued in your, in your comments on that. Thank you. Who would like to take a punt at that one first? Uh, I think William and then Pavel, perhaps. And then we'll just go down through John and Heather. Okay, thank you. Um, so to your questions, I, and I think this builds on what Heather was saying, I actually think the ratio type solution plus confidence building measures is the way to get China involved. Because if you include dual capable medium and longer range systems and you tell every country they have the ability to mix and match, then you're not saying to China you have to go down from where you are. You could just look at what they have right now and cap it there. Uh, and, and then say, you know, what, whatever you want to do, whether it's ICBMs, SLBMs, um, conventional anti-ship, whatever, all goes into that basket. So that the first step for China is not you have to eliminate thousands of something, but rather we say for the US, for Russia and China, you have this cap on longer range, ballistic cruise, hypersonic, uh, I don't think the ratio thing is especially important because I think warhead for warhead is fine. And by the way, Russia, uh, to answer something Pavel said, Russia has demonstrated avant-garde under New START. So, you know, it has to get up there and it's going to get up there through a ballistic missile. So it's going to be limited by New START anyway. So I do think um, a ratio is the way to get China involved. You say, how, all right, how many systems do you have? Just give us that number and then mix and match between, as I said, um, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, sub-launch ballistic missiles, longer range cruise missiles, hypersonic, and say, okay, that's your limit. You can mix and match. Inspection would be totally based on delivery system and not on warheads. We've never been good on warheads, and I don't think we're, we're there yet. I think things like IPNDV have to go further before you can get there on warheads. Uh, and that's how you move to trilateral, is you just, you, you, you look at, at, you open up the aperture, and your first step would be a confidence building measure on numbers and types and doctrine, just like Heather said. And then you would look at restraints um, mixing and matching uh, all the systems and say, you, you know, you have 4,000 or 5,000 total systems, whether they're conventional, nuclear, longer range, medium range, air launch, ground launch, sea launch, whatever. Uh, I, I think that's really the only way to do it. Otherwise, there is no incentive for China. And the whole idea that you're going to come up with a framework to approach it, I think is very difficult. I think it's more building confidence from the bottom up. Uh, to use John's analogy, it's got to be from the bottom up. You've got to start with confidence before you can have the overarching framework. If all parties agree to go in with the overarching framework, the, the constituents in that agreement matter less. I think you're gonna have a much harder time getting at that overarching. I think you're gonna to have to approach it through confidence building measures and then to restraint and then potentially to roll back in limitations. And again, I think it has to go beyond trilateral. I think it has to be global. Thanks, William. Who else would like to paddle? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I wish I, yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer how to. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Uh, but just one thought. I, I think that if we, if we, if we want uh, China to get uh, into this uh, business, uh, I think it's uh, it would be useful to demonstrate that it actually works. And I think if we look back at the last uh, several years, uh, there is not much there to show. Uh, because uh, there is, uh, there used to be the ABM treaty, no longer there. Uh, there used to be the INF treaty. Uh, they look at us and say, "Well, you can sort it out." I mean, not uh, uh, not trying to uh, kind of put uh, blame on any uh, particular uh, uh, particular side. Uh, you look at a uh, number of systems uh, like Flickens, they're not covered by anything. Uh, air launch cruise missiles, they are not really. Hypersonic, I just mentioned that there is, uh, there is a big question mark uh, whether they will be covered at all because the US position, Russia, uh, thanks uh, William, Russia did show this avant-garde it will come, but only because it just happens that it, it is deployed on the treaty accountable uh, missile. And the, the, the United States was very careful not to do that. And this is why they, so I, I think it's that, I mean, if I were uh, uh, Chinese, I would say, well, what it is that you are inviting me to join? There is not much there. And there is not much uh, that I could gain because uh, you themselves showed that there are ways 
around all these treaties and you cannot really uh, find a good way to, to sort, uh, sort out your differences. That would be my take. Thanks. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, John? Yes, I, I, I sort of build on what Pavel said. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, and you hinted at the, the root of the problem, but you only highlighted the United States. And I think it's slightly unfair, although they're front and center in national interest is that we've essentially moved over the last 15 years of a shift of arms control from mutual interest to self-interest and, and dumping arms control agreements when self-interest as self-defined was not being met. And, and, in that, in, in that, uh, and in that concept, which is clear and apparent, there's no incentive for any nation at the moment to join in arms control um, because their self-interest is like unlikely to dominate the self-interest of either of the two main players. So I think it 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 comes down to where I began and where William is is that without the trust, without the building of confidence, this isn't going to work. And I think one of the major indicators will be the way in which the world comes out of COVID nineteen. There are two broad directions. One is collaborative work is the only way to solve major crises. And the other one is the only way to solve this is moats and castles and, uh, and nationalised self-interest. If we go down the latter, which I have to say is emanating from a number of national capitals, if we go down the latter, then arms control, we might as well give up because in that, in that, uh, in that national approach to international business, arms control is very low on the list. If we go down the former, then that is a fertile ground for, for mutual interest being the driver. And I think the only thing I'll add is, is beyond that, um, once you achieve mutual interest, you start to understand and once more um, believe that a certain degree of mutual assured vulnerability is an essential prerequisite for successful arms control. It was what was behind the ABM treaty. Um, you know, the, the one that is possibly last on people's lists of successful arms control, but it was based on mutual vulnerability, which is much more stabilizing than mutual destruction. John, thanks. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Halo. Just very quickly to your second question, what are the prospects of moving to trilateral arms control in the next nine months? Pretty low. Um, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor to have those discussions, but I think you need to extend New Start now to buy time for that. I mean, China just doesn't have those experiences and needs to um, build up their own confidence in arms control practice. And just very quickly, I, I, I want to push back a little bit on what John just said, which is this idea that you are either acting in mutual interest or self-interest. I think that states will act, I think states always act in their self-interest, but sometimes there's a commonality of self-interest and an overlap in self-interest. So for example, if you can save more money by cooperating rather than by competing, that, then that's in your self-interest, but it also just happens to be um, a shared self-interest. So I, I don't think that it's that states are suddenly no longer interested in any sort of cooperation or collaboration. I think it's just that they've made the decision that their self-interests are better served by acting alone. And so again, I come back to kind of my last point from my remarks, which is I think the economics are going to provide one of the best incentives for states to return to the practice of arms control because it's in their self-interest. And that arms control provides an opportunity, it does provide a cost-saving opportunity, not all the time, but some of the time, particularly with an emerging technology. Thanks, Heather. Uh, and we have a question uh, from uh, Dmitry Stefanovic. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Dmitry. We can hear you fine. Hi. Great. Uh, it's a wonderful event, and I'm so happy to see so many great people speaking about the subject everyone is very concerned with. So, uh, a, a small question, probably, and a bigger comment. A small question is. Uh, Everyone mentions China and speaks about trilateral arms control, but uh, Russian starting point is that it's not only about China, it is at least about P5, and then uh, for like nine unofficial nuclear weapon states. What can uh, the people uh, at the panel say about uh, what can France and the UK do with regard to nuclear arms control and probably show the way forward 
for China in asymmetric arms control, or is there is nothing they can show? And a broader point, um, when we speak about uh, like hypersonic weapons and mix and match and so on, probably it is the right time to stop focusing on exact technology and just like make a broad basket of conventional or non dual capable long range precision weapons and discuss those. Because uh, if we speak again about China and about Russia to some extent, the biggest concern are the US superiority in terms of uh, conventional long range uh, SLICAMs and LCAMs, which are not covered by anything. And last small point about the pandemic. Uh, I agree that it might be a, a good reason to engage in arms control, but this reason might be not only in cost saving, but also because of, at least for Russia, cost saving might lead to even more focus on uh, dual capable systems. And uh, in this regard, uh, some transparency might be useful to pre to for security of everyone but uh, from the russian side there might be little incentives to offer this transparency as this dual capability is seen as something useful this ambiguity is seen as enhancing security so these challenges must be considered thank you thanks dimitri uh who in the panel would like to, to tackle that uh william and pavel for starters uh uh, just a very brief, uh, brief uh, uh, note uh, uh, on uh, on this ambiguity and the uh, the role of uh, ambiguity. Uh, I think Mitri is uh, exactly correct that this is uh, uh, this is something uh, this is something that is part of the way that Russia uh, thinks about the. Uh, its uh, nuclear and conventional weapons and its deterrence capability, and uh, and I, and I think there is a good link to uh, what uh, Admiral Gower uh, said earlier that uh, the in many ways uh, the, these are dual capable the cruise, nuclear cruise missiles uh, they they uh, they are a problem and uh, ballistic missiles, uh, and uh, I think uh, one way of looking at this uh, is uh, to uh, maybe try to disentangle those and uh, actually uh, work toward a, uh, an agreement that would uh, eliminate that ambiguity, that would eliminate uh, nuclear capability from uh, classes of systems. It will not solve all the problems, but it will solve a pretty big chunk <laughs> of the problem. And, uh, and in fact, there are uh, there are ways of doing that. There are ways to uh, remove the nuclear capability in a verifiable way. We've done some work on that. Uh, so it's uh, it's something that we we may want to, uh, we may want to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. William. Yeah. So um, just three quick things. Um, first of all, uh, something that Heather said about China and arms control. Uh, I'm mindful that China ran one of the most uh, effective arms control agreements ever, the, the Five Nation Agreement from the 90s with Russia, China, and, and the other border countries to demarcate their border and to move uh, military assets out of the border region. The end of the inspection period and reduction period of that treaty resulted in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China conducted hundreds of on-site inspections, very similar to CFE inspections. So I think China knows very well how arms control can work and should work and does work. Uh, so, so I know a lot of people don't know about that agreement. I encourage you, uh, Sam Charap has written about it. It's a, it's a really fascinating agreement. Um, second of all, um, I, I think uh, what Dimitri's question, he's exactly right. I think it is about the, the whole idea of mixing and matching is what we care is the effect of these systems, not their particular technology. So I don't care whether it's hypersonic or or I don't even care if it's ballistic, cruise, or undersea. If it's intercontinental and capable of being nuclear armed, then you have to find a way to limit it. So the mix and match idea is one way to try to capture systems based on total effects. And this is why the INF Treaty was so successful for its time. It didn't address the question of whether it was a nuclear armed missile or a conventional armed missile, because in, an, in a crisis situation, you're going to have no faith 
that your judgment is going to be 100 percent. You're going to have to assume that it's nuclear armed. So the idea of nuclear versus conventional, the idea of demarcating strictly on technology is, is not very useful. You have to look much more broadly. What are the effects of these systems and capture them that way? And, and that's why uh, I, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Marshall Billingsley for the U.S., he has a big challenge. I would agree entirely that uh, the first step would just be to extend new start so that you don't put yourself under this pressure, um, but then you start with confidence building measures. And also to Dimitri's question, it is about the P5. And I think the work that's been happening in the NPT review conference, uh, with Heather, which Heather is very familiar with, the P5 has done some really extraordinary work and people don't give them enough credit considering where they were five years ago, 10 years ago, they've done extraordinary work and they're gonna to need to continue to do work. France and the UK can demonstrate asymmetric arms control because they've both put themselves under unilateral restriction in terms of um, uh, uh, HEU and plutonium production uh, and warhead counts. Um, they've both unilaterally declared the cessation of production of fissile material uh, for weapons and um, not increasing warhead totals. So that's a good demonstration of how uh, within the P5, they can, dis they can discuss strategic stability concepts more broadly. They can talk about confidence building measures and France and the UK have a really good news story to tell in terms of contributing to a potential future farms control. Thanks, William. Uh, John, Heather, any, anyone? Uh, yes, um, the, uh, William's just slightly stolen some of the sandwiches of what I was going to say, but I think, uh, and I, I would naturally, as a, as a Brit, agree wholeheartedly with what he's, he'd said. And so I think in the questions that talk about um, when it is raised, Dimitri, to, to, it is necessary to expand to five to move forward at two or three, I always find myself questioning the why that is being raised. Is it because it is naturally to achieve something with five is better than with three, or is it actually... Uh, and forgive me to stall movement at two or three because because frankly the uk has reduced to a single strategic system it has placed as uh, as william has said uh, self restrictions and reductions throughout the period that um, other arms controls have maintained stasis and during the process that some uh, members of the p5 are raising numbers of types of system, if not actual warhead numbers, we maintain a negative removal. We've gone to a single system, France is almost there. They can't quite let go of their air system yet. Uh, they'll realize they don't need it and it's not helpful at some point in their history. But I think, uh, I think if, if it is, we will join you in order to assist going in that direction, then I think the UK would be minded. But if it's part of a process to unless the UK and France move in the same direction, we won't go anywhere, then I'm afraid I see that as a stalking horse holding off proper arms control from nuclear armed states who have not gone far enough down the arms control route. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm not quite so minded that it's, uh, that it's a positive uh, without the right caveats and understanding of what's behind the question. Thanks, John. And there's a question from Peter Watkins. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine, Peter. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Um, I'm glad that John never brought his sandwiches into the office, by the way. Um, I want you to ask a quick follow-up point on what William said about the need for global solutions. And of course, I accept that, but it just really doesn't seem realistic at the moment, given the underlying uh, security dilemmas and so on that he mentioned. And Heather's mentioned confidence building measures a number of times. And I just wonder, given where we are more broadly, we don't need to look at confidence building measures in a much broader way in order to try and reduce some of the concerns that exist at the moment. And I'm thinking of things like the old incidents at sea agreements and so on, whether we should be looking to extend them and, and, and bring them into some of the new domains. Also, um, you know, doesn't this pandemic actually offer us an opportunity to rebuild some of the links that we used to have? I mean, not least with the Russians, um, and to try and take this forward. Thanks, Peter. Uh, who in the panel would like to have a, a, a punt at, at those questions? Okay, we'll start with John. 
at the risk of being the first one to, to answer a question from one's former boss. Um, I will just say that yesterday I was, uh, I was in a, a, a conference call and a podcast looking at a, um, a potential crisis communication system for nuclear command authorities of the nine nuclear armed states. It, it's looking at uh, uh, the likes of ex-Google people and other tech people to provide something that's 21st century. And one of the questions that came out of that was how do you, how do you utilize the coronavirus crisis as a means of, uh, of getting people to talk to each other, at least have this kind of discussion? And I think, and I think, as I said in my remarks, I think there are, there, there are two directions that we can go. Uh, and I think we should seek to grasp the, the, the better of the two directions, which is to maximize um, the contribution and discussion on points that are less contentious as hooks for the stuff that is more contentious. And I think one of the reasons I was talking on this yesterday was that, that, that an agreement that there should be some way for all nine nuclear weapon state heads of state to talk to each other in a safe, secure and, uh, and identified by a metrically identified way in a crisis is a good thing. And so let's have a conversation on that and, and perhaps find other things in the, in the pantheon of, of what we're discussing, which are less contentious to build um, a little bit more respect for each other. Thank you. Thanks, John. And the, uh, yeah, William? Um, so I think Peter asked really, really excellent questions. In terms of the global, I would say there is a lot of there there is a lot of opportunity. I mean, when you look at something like the Hague Code of Conduct or the Missile Technology and Control Regime, there's a lot of unused potential there. There's a lot of proposals that are already on the table. But what's happening right now is in those agreements, especially in Hague Code of Conduct, one country will come in with a bunch of ideas. No one's prepared for it, so they just sort of fall off the table, or UN First Committee, or, or something like that. That's why I think NATO can play a strong role in developing a whole set of ideas to take into these regimes. And then you don't just have one country, you have 30 or 40 countries coming in with a series of ideas that can really transform some of the global export control regimes. So that's what I would hope there. But I do take your point totally. Broader confidence building measures are very important. And you brought up something really interesting, which would be adapting INCSIs to new domains. Well, if you actually read the published uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff instruction on implementing the ink seeds, one of the paragraphs in there says one of the reasons the U.S. publishes the ink seed and the instruction is so that other countries can adapt similar or the same procedures. I think every country should have an ink seed type arrangement where you've got something where just like John was saying, where you have hotlines, verifiable hotlines, where you have 24-7 um, crisis center, where you've collected all of your notifications, whether it's no TAMs, or tests or exercises into one center, the way the US and Russia have their nuclear risk reduction centers. So you have a series of regional um, INCSI type agreements uh, that help to manage conflicts because right now INCSIs are completely bilateral. And I also think adapting INCSI type rules to other domains is gonna be important. I think um, sort of the rules of the road for space are gonna be the way forward there. You're not gonna have strict arms control Unless we develop arms control inspectors, I'm happy to wear a spacesuit and go out there and inspect things. I don't think that's likely. I think it's going to be more like the rules of the road for the sea, INCSIs and um, cues and other ways of governing behavior in space. Because obviously for escalation, space is very important when you have uh, command and control and nuclear command and control, uh, conventional, uh, commercial and military all intermingled. The, the chances for escalation due to space conflict are very high. So we're going to need to have some sort of rules of the road. And again, I don't think it's going to be arms control. I think it's going to be more um, norms, rules, uh, behaviors, uh, transparency, things like that. Thanks, William. Uh, we have a question from Sophie McCormack. Hi, um, thank you so much um, to the panelists and to the Biodiversity for putting this on. So I had a question based off of um, William's comment about global arms control. So just two small questions. Um, if NATO's focus is on global arms control, um, and that is the objective of their arms control efforts, then one, if global arms control, is global arms control a credible 
or achievable first goal, especially given the current environment. And two, if accepting that regional or bipolar arms control still has its place, who should lead on this and what is NATO's role in supporting such initiatives? Thanks, Sophie. Okay. William, it's all yours. So, um, in talking about missiles and how to address missile threats, I think the answer has to be global. Uh, I, I, as I said in my remarks, um, it has to be. Because even if you said, okay, NATO and Russia enter into an agreement, okay, well, what about Ukraine and what about Belarus and what about Sweden and Finland? They're, that just doesn't matter. So then, you know, the U.S. says, well, what about China? China says, what about India? India says, what about Pakistan? Pakistan says, what about Israel? Israel says, what about Iraq? It's global. Uh, it, it, any way that we have to address missiles is going to end up global. There is absolutely a, ro a, a role for regional arms control. Absolutely, 100%. And that's why we have things like the OSCE. That's why we have the Vienna document, the CFE Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, to try to manage that regional conflict. And I, and I actually wish there were OSCEs for other regions as well, for uh, Northeast Asia, for South Asia, uh, permanent bodies that dealt with the security in all three human baskets that can maintain that kind of stability and provide that sort of crisis management. Uh, I think if we could export that for other regions and to learn from the negative lessons that the OSCE, I mean, the OSCE isn't perfect, to learn the positive lessons and the negative lessons and apply those globally. And again, to apply things like INCSEs and um, risk reduction centers and notifications, things like the Vienna document um, in different regions around the world would be tremendously helpful. So I think there's a lot to do on regional arms control in the Euro-Atlantic area. And I think there are lessons that can be applied. And I want to get back to something that was said earlier. I'm not just worried about conflicts between two nuclear armed states. That's a huge concern. But I think any conflict on Earth using advanced weapons probably involves one or more nuclear armed states as a patron or as a direct party. And so what we should really be getting at is conflict prevention writ large, not just focusing on nuclear. And that's going to re require things like the Vienna document, like NCs on a more global scale. Thanks, William. Anybody else on the panel want to pile in? If not, then uh, we will go to another question. Uh, this one's from... Oh, okay, John, on you go. Sorry, it's just, sorry for this point of precedence, but there's no other way of saying it. We have questions coming up by attendees raising their hand and asking them on the... We've also got written questions. Can I just ask how you're going to manage the two? Because I don't want the people who've written questions to feel we're, they're being ignored. I'm going to go one more... Uh, hand question and then we'll go through the written ones the ones that we haven't addressed there are a couple of them that have been kind of touched on but ben ben barry thanks i'm really attracted to heather's point about the economic damage of coronavirus hitting public spending and therefore defense budgets and enlightened economic self-interest being a driver and this seems to me the only driver that would work in Pyongyang or Tehran. But there is another possible future that defense spending cuts, prioritize cuts to conventional forces and both nuclear and conventional strategic weapons increase in importance. I hope that's not unhelpful, but it'd be interesting to know what the panel think of that. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and do you want to have a quick punt at that one? John. Yeah, Ben, I absolutely recognise that. And it, it doesn't help when, uh, when some nuclear arms states are expanding the range of things which they view their nuclear weapons as counters to, because the natural uh, sweep of that, the natural extension of that is that you will see other things that expensive conventional capabilities uh, can be sacrificed upon the altar of, well, we'll solve that with a nuclear response. Um, so I think uh, it, is, it is inherent upon everybody, to everyone with nuclear weapons, to try and focus back down onto something approaching sole purpose, because unless and until sole purpose is a relatively agreed um, position to be in, there is this risk that uh, nuclear weapons will be the, the economic panacea. Whilst expensive, they are in being for those that have them. And it is much easier to make uh, 
a cups of a variety of salami thicknesses to conventional forces. Hello, and then Pavel. Um, yeah, I think I I think you're raising a really great point about how the economic impact. I mean, it could go so many different ways. And this kind of also gets to Dimitri's excellent point earlier. I think really the economic impact of coronavirus on defense spending, but also on arms control depends on this much bigger question, which is what will be the nature of geopolitics when we come out of this crisis. And, um, you know, you hear some people saying, oh, maybe it'll inspire a new era of cooperation and collaboration. You know, after these types of crises, maybe countries and societies can come together. Um, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm much more of a pessimist on that, on that point and think that actually we're going to come out of this crisis more competitive than ever. And you can already see it, I think, in how, um, you know, like the development of U.S.-China relations. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that arms control determines geopolitics. It works the other way around. So really, the geopolitical climate, I think, is what will determine whether or not you can have arms control. Um, and then these economic incentives might mix in with it, but really the geopolitics after COVID is really going to be the determining factor. Great, thank you. Pavel? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fair, fair question whether the uh, kind of budgetary constraints uh, would, would push people into kind of a more nuclear uh, weapons, but, uh, but I, I, my take and I, I would uh, probably uh, try to be a bit of an optimist here is that uh, actually, if you look at the uh, various nuclear modernization programs, uh, they are, they have been going ahead, not because there is a, any particular need uh, to build more nuclear weapons, it's because there were resources that those modernization programs could absorb. And definitely uh, uh, there, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of interested parties who would uh, who would uh, be happy to participate in those modernization programs? I think there, if we if we see the kind of a, a, a const budgetary constraints on the military in general, uh, I, I think it's uh, that that would, uh, would there there are quite a few programs that that could be safely uh, safely cut. I would say, and uh, and I think uh, we should not just uh, kind of. We should not pretend that they are like absolutely necessary from uh, some kind of a security perspective. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, I'll go to the reading question. So thank you, everybody who's been patiently waiting. Um, there's one from Madeleine Creerin uh, and an anonymous one, both of which uh, kind of round the trilateral issue. Uh, so I'll just read them out uh, and the panelists can, can jump in as they see fit. Uh, when the Trump administration introduced the concept of tri-party arms control agreements, the first reaction was that China isn't interested, and the second was what would motivate China to participate and be interested. Have we really discussed the opposite? Why a trilateral arms control agreement would be beneficial to anyone? Is this indeed something worth seeking? Why or why not? Uh, and a further question, which was, New START restricts warheads for US and Russia to 1,550, China's 300. How would a trilateral agreement work? Uh, I think both uh, uh, very, very uh, acute questions. Uh, who would like to start? Hello. Um, I'll, have a, I'll have a first stab at this. Um, I, I really like Madeline Creedon's questions as I usually like everything that Madeline says. Um, so I think it is worth revisiting how we all started talking about trilateral arms control in the first place and or at least in the its most recent recent iteration and i do think that this administration has used the idea of trilateral arms control as a red herring it is an excuse it was an excuse to withdraw from inf it's an excuse to punt and delay on new start and i don't know if that is because the administration just has an inconsistent policy on arms control and can't make up its mind or if it's just not interested in arms control and is looking for another explanation with that said, I do think that, in, that bringing China into arms control is a worthwhile endeavor. However, it's a much more mid to long term endeavor than this administration seems to think. I think it's worthwhile to bring them in. Again, I just keep going back to Thomas Schelling for the reasons of crisis stability and arms race stability, but particularly with China for crisis stability regions or for crisis stability reasons um, in an increasingly competitive area of the world. 
But again, I, I, I think that Madeline was raising a really important point, which, which is that we should, we should be really critically evaluating what are the be benefits of this? How soon can we get to them? Um, and I hope that I'm interpreting her question right. And I haven't gone too political, but I do think that there, I think there are some people in the current administration who genuinely believe in trilateral arms control because China is a peer competitor at this point and you want to have some means of managing competition with your peer competitor. I, I buy into that, but I also think that there are some in the administration who have used it um, as an excuse. And just very quickly to the second question on how would it actually work? I would highly recommend a piece by Tong Zhao in um, Arms Control Today, I think it was in March of this year, in which he outlines a really coherent vision for trilateral arms control, whereby US, Russia, China have um, a common ceiling of, I can't remember if it's launchers or delivery vehicles, I think it's delivery vehicles, and I think he sets it at 600. And the point there being it, that it would also include cruise missiles. And so it would be deeper cuts for the US and Russia. It wouldn't be as big of a cut on the Chinese side. Um, but coming from a really informed Chinese expert, I thought that was, what, that was an interesting idea for what it might look like. It's, and just very quick clarification point. I really, I think William's absolutely right in the point he made earlier that China does have a really rich history of arms control. Um, if you look at how they took on leadership in the P5 process, um, if you, I mean, they would say that they are a leader in arms control through the NPT. So I completely agree with that. But I do think we have to be conscious that the US and Russia have this 50 year history of strategic arms control and experience, and China hasn't been part of that experience. And so getting them to buy into that type of arms control, I think is gonna be a harder sell. Thanks, Heather. Uh, William? Thank you. Um, yeah, that is a great question. It's great to hear from Madeline, a uh, wonderful colleague, uh, and uh, we miss her at NATO. Um, you know, China is the only member of the P5 that has no constraint whatsoever on fissile material or on warheads. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we say 300. Is that the right number? Is it 600? Is it 900? We don't know. Uh, how many actual delivery systems do they have? If you go with just ICBMs and SLBMs, they're going up. Uh, more capable and more numbers. What does that force structure eventually look like? No one knows. China's official policy is opacity. They say no first use covers all of it. No, it doesn't. Their force structure is something that we don't know what the final is going to look like. And with all the dual capable systems they have, and the fact that they've been producing fissile material since the late 50s, how much fissile material do they need? They should be able to have some form of constraint. And I think that would be the first thing, would be within the P5, for China to join the UK and France in unilateral restraint on warhead numbers, a statement like, as long as the US and Russia continues on the strategic um, reductions, uh, strategic agreements, China will not race up to their level or, and give some idea about a number and that they'll cut off this on material production. That would be wonderful. Um, but honestly, we just, we don't know what their numbers are. Um, and I do think um, the, the piece that you mentioned, arms control today, is exactly right. When you look at delivery systems and capabilities, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and there is a way to, to just get a number and to get a cap. That alone would be a huge step forward without requiring any Chinese reductions, just some transparency on, in terms of numbers, in terms of types, in terms of their plans would be huge. And I think the P5 is moving towards that in the NPT process. I think the seminar on doctrine that they were going to have at the review conference this year was going to be a huge step forward. And I look forward to that and more from the P5 process moving forward that, that Heather alluded to. She's done great work helping them. And uh, we at NATO want to help the P5 as well. I think it's a, I think it's a great process and can help China to engage in a, in a rational way. Anybody else in the park? John? Yeah, while acknowledging all that William said, um, I think that uh, if it's how China is approached to bring into uh, moving two to three, that the two discussions have all been based on the fact that both parties need to do something about whatever it is that's being discussed in arms control. Uh, that may not be the sense across the board for China. There may be areas where um, the trilateral agreement won't touch a particular area of Chinese capability because simply they're not there yet. And, th and that might be simply caps on warhead numbers or delivery vehicles, although we're in the dark on them and some shed of light would be the best view of it. 
So I think there would be one of the ways to incentivize Chinese involvement would be to perhaps say that this isn't, you don't join this with the expectation that you have to, you're going to get reductions in everything that you've got um, or controls on everything that you've got because your position is different. And I think that's one of the reasons why France and the UK would see themselves as holding back because they, they don't want to tie their much lower capabilities into a system that it's currently dealing with very high numbers and very diverse vehicles between Russia and the US. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a way of approaching multilateral arms control that isn't the template that's worked for um, US and Russia. Thanks, John. Um, I'm conscious we're already over time, but unless anybody in the panel has a horribly allergic reaction, I'd like to run the session on for at least another 10 minutes, simply because there's some very, very interesting questions still to get through. Um, one from Tom Hickey. Uh, several of the panelists have already mentioned the possibility of using existing frameworks, such as the Hague Code of Conduct and the MTCR to enhance uh, or strengthen arms control. Could you go into more detail about what exactly this would look like and provide suggestions? Who would, who would like to uh, have a first stab at that? Heather. Um, so I'm gonna leave MTCR and Hague Code of Conduct for William because he's the one who brought them up. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> However, um, as a different forum, it's come up a few times um, is the P5 process. And so I'm sure as most people know, the P5 are engaging in increasingly detailed dialogues um, about transparency into their doctrines. That strikes me as a wonderful opportunity for the P5 to start talking um, a bit more about missile technologies, hypersonics. It'll be an obvious challenge. Um, one of the issues also with the P5 is that because it's often the participants are sometimes rooted in um, the, the State Department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there's definitely like involvement by defense officials. But I think that the, in the P5, you might have a bit of a challenge of always getting the right people in the room. But based on what we saw, um, so Kings and the European Leadership Network, um, we uh, led a project on the P5 and worked really closely with the UK Foreign Office. And they were wonderful in terms of transparency. But based on what we saw, there is, does seem an increasing interest um, and a bit of momentum behind the, the doctrines discussion. And so it's not your traditional arms control. It isn't fitting into an existing treaty necessarily. But those are the types of, I think, um, CBMs that we can look to to take advantage of. Thanks, Heather. Anybody, anybody else want to have a quick? OK, um, well, I'll make this the last couple of questions. Uh, Paul Schultz and Paul Bernstein. Um, a plausible description of one likely strategic role of hypersonic missiles in regional crisis in Europe and East Asia is that they would be used to paralyze defensive responses through rapid elimination of assets and control centers. If that's at least conceivable, isn't it? How can it be expected to be divulged and discussed in military to military talks and doctrine? Uh, and the other question on HGVs, yeah, the issue of missile defence seems to be lurking behind some of this discussion. Russia sees global range HGVs as a means to give it higher confidence to overcome US defences. The US is pursuing regional hypersonics to enable defeat of Chinese integrated air defences. The US has also taken initial steps towards defences tailored to HGVs. How does the panel see the offence defence dynamics when considering the challenge of regulating missiles? Can anyone envision a freedom to mix approaches that covers both offence and defence? Uh, and you've got about a minute each to discuss, <laughs> to discuss this. Who would, who would like to try and take a punt at that first? Pavel. Yeah, let me, let me try the missile defence one. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the issue with missile defence uh, is that it's, uh, it literally poisons everything. And, uh, the way I usually put it, it's that the uh, the missile defense works uh, very well uh, against missiles that don't exist. So uh, uh, in the end, and we've seen that cycle uh, a number of times. Uh, we uh, so the, the 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 pursuit of missile defense will 
only motivate people to build more missiles and in the end uh, we all kind of realize that oh missile defense doesn't work and so we all end up with more missiles or more diverse missiles or or, or with more bizarre uh, systems uh, so uh, I don't think that there is a chance of kind of a there, there it doesn't make sense to establish a kind of a separate limit or ceiling on uh, defense and offense. Uh, I think it's just uh, it's the realization that missile defense doesn't doesn't work, doesn't contribute to anything to the security. Uh, that's the uh, pretty much the only way to uh, go with that. Thanks, John. Yeah, I was going to to comment on the missile defense question. I think it. it I, I always bring it back to my question about focusing on mutually assured vulnerability rather than. Um, assurances and I, I think the, the problem that missile defense throws into this is in chasing the unicorn of assured defense you you play very poor games with stability in the offense side I think the chances of having an arms control agreement that brought the two of them together into some kind of understood and agreed framework where you played one off against the other, I think is virtually nil. Because I think whilst it is reasonably, we are reasonably capable of understanding a dialogue where you're equating offensive systems against offensive systems, the unproven nature of defensive capabilities and the natural tendency to overestimate their, their um, importance or, or viability means that I don't think you're going to get a, a discussion that is meaningful. So I don't think you'll see joint, uh, you'll see joint combined arms control leading with offence and defence. I do think um, a slightly less evangelistic approach to missile defence will aid stability um, in the offensive arms control. Thanks, John. Uh, anybody else want to? William. Yeah, to me, I mean, the hypersonic argument and that, you know, maybe there's parts of doctrine that people won't be willing to go to. I mean, to me, hypersonics are just another form of non-ballistic missile. It's a way to try to, uh, as people point out, to, to evade defenses. But I mean, if you, if you do wargaming with cruise missiles or with hypersonic missiles, if you can't detect it, and you can't defend against it, it really doesn't matter how fast it's going. Um, so I kind of think hypersonic in and of itself is a little bit of chasing a technology for technology's sake. It's non-ballistic stuff. You can't detect its launch very well. You can't track its path very well. And it's maneuverable in the final phase so it can hit. That's the same thing with the cruise missile. So um, I think whatever doctrine you have for first strike is what we have to get at. And what tools you're using for that first strike are really kind of irrelevant to me. And that gets back to what Dimitri had said before. Um, that that's really important. And I did want to say on the previous question, on the hate code of conduct, there's there's lots of ideas out there on what else you would do. Um, removing the focus from ballistic missile to, to further delivery systems, looking at definitions, looking at the types and systems covered, looking at compliance rates, an MTCR, looking at membership. I mean, there's a lot of ways that, that if you were really taking the global missile threat seriously, the kinds of ideas that you would come out with and that you could come out with a very large coalition of nations to fix, I think would be, would be rather large. Thank you very much. Um, I won't even, oh, Heather, do you want the last word? Please do. It's gonna be really quick though, because I think Paul Bernstein's question is a really important one. Um, so um, as part of a study at King's, we've been looking at opportunities for asymmetric arms control and exchanges that you could make across domains. And missile defense is one of the hardest ones to really even conceive of. But one idea that this, this came up a few years ago and I haven't really heard anyone mention it since, was Russia was asking the US for legally binding limits on its missile defenses in Europe. And that was something where it's enough of a limit. It's like it's, you're, you're stopping something from going any further. Um, you aren't talking about any redu reduction or, um, or drawback in current missile defenses. And that was something where in a lot of the trade-offs and scenarios that we were playing with, that seemed like something that would be worth exploring. Um, but as I said, I haven't really heard anyone in Russia at least bring that up in the past year or so, maybe it's there and I've just missed it. But also, I mean, that presents really obvious challenges for the United States and assurance to allies. But in terms of missile defense, like arms control, absent renewing ABM, that was really one of the only kind of scenarios that I could think of. 
and that brings us up almost to half past one. I, as a chair, have uh, soundly abused my position by letting this go on for half an hour longer than, than uh, um, a forecast, as it were. Uh, but I'm sure uh, all the participants, are, there are still many and there's still some outstanding questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going get to get to go around to those. Um, but it's been a very, very valuable uh, session. In terms of uh, summing up or can make, making a conclusion or two out of this, I wouldn't even attempt to do that. Uh, it's been very, very rich indeed. Two things I will take away from this though. Uh, the first of which is that New Start really needs to be extended uh, to buy some time because otherwise uh, there is uh, the momentum behind uh, the unraveling, as it were, will only continue. Uh, secondly, um, this is a conversation we all need to continue uh, because it's very, very important. And um, with that, I'd just like to thank William, Pavel, John and Heather for their time uh, and their incisive comments. Thank you very, very much.